This lecture by Richard A. Matheson on Human Evolution Part 1, Latest Science, Fascinating Questions, was presented on July 29, 2018. Okay. Welcome. Welcome to Human Evolution, Latest Science, Fascinating Questions. And this is my first time with PowerPoint, so if I seem inexperienced, it's because I am. <laughs> okay, uh, back today. This is Jane Goodall with three chimpanzees. And Human Evolution is about the evolution from chimpanzees to fully modern humans like Jane Goodall, or me, or you. And there were five major changes that happened in human evolution. Quickly, the brain size, okay? The brain, the human brain is three times as large as a chimpanzee brain. Language, okay? Morality and cooperation, extensive use of tools, and I've saved this for last because it's sort of the newest focus, but it's marriage, in-laws, fatherhood, <laughs> emotions, and child raising. In other words, marriage and the family. A lot of new stuff on that. So here are chimpanzees lining up for sex with a female, that's the female in estrus. When the female is in estrus, she sends out signals that have all the males very excited. Okay, and so she is mating, she had it set with that male, and those are waiting in line. Okay, this is a real picture, although we can't find it, so I made this one up. But, uh, <clears throat> and she's very willing to have sex with any or all of them. It's a big change from the sexual uh, promiscuity of chimpanzees to the marriage culture of humans. Okay, these are our five major changes, one, two, three, four, five. I'm gonna cover them in order and have a, a time, brief time for questions after each one. All right, evolution timeline. We start at 245 million years ago with the age of dinosaurs, which came to a crashing end at 66 million years ago when they all went extinct, right? But then, the next thing was the age of mammals and motherhood until today. And this is uh, <clears throat> the monkey mother here. Now, mammals are warm-blooded with nature's great invention, which is mothers. Mothers who give birth to live young instead of laying eggs. And the species we care about most are these primates, the monkeys and apes. So here are the primates, they live in trees, mostly monkeys and apes, and there are 260 species of monkeys, and there are four apes, gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and then actually humans are considered an ape. And all primates are tree-oriented, they live in trees, and they all have a hands with opposable thumb, and they have on their feet an opposable thumb on their feet. An opposable thumb on their feet. All primates have it except for one. Man. Which one doesn't have it? Man. Humans. Okay, take off your shoes if you're not sure which one doesn't have. Okay, all of us, all, oops, what do I want here? Okay, so the start of human evolution is this. About five to seven million years ago, some of these chimpanzees with opposable thumbs on their feet came down to the ground, started living on the ground, walking on two legs instead of four, and they, they lived on the ground, which was very dangerous due to predators, and they came down because of climate change, the gradual drying up and shrinking of the vast rainforests of Africa. And in fact, I have a picture, that's a rainforest, and that's sort of what it might have looked like when it dried up. Okay, topic number one, tripling of brain size. 
Uh, here we have a human evolution timeline which goes from five million years ago, okay, up to zero million years ago, which just means today. And you can see the brain is growing. Anyway, here is our human evolution timeline from five million years ago, and there is that chimpanzee that came down, the last common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans, with a brain size of 450 cc's, cubic centimeters. And you can double that to 91350 to get a sense of how large human is. Here at the line of 1350 cc's is fully modern humans of 50,000 years BP. BP just means before present. Okay? So that's what's going to be happening. That's our timeline of 5 million years. And some people, I used to think it sort of went gradually up like that. Well, it didn't. Here is how it looked. These are the Australopithecines. The most famous one is Lucy. She was about three and a half million years, 3.2. But the brain stayed the same size all the way to two and a half million years. It didn't increase at all. What did happen was a lot of other changes that we know about because the opposable thumb and the feet became a big toe, the uh, pelvis were walking upright, the shoulders so he could wield a club, the teeth to become omnivores eating all sorts of food rather than chip, chip as he's just eat fruit. So that's the first half of our whole evolution. Then we had something called Homo habilis, Homo habilis is translated as handyman, because as you can see, they had tools and butchering for the first time at two and a half billion. And then, whoops, that's the wrong one. And then here we have Homo erectus starting there, and the brain increases over this last two million years all the way up to the full size, and there we get to the fully modern humans. So, now there was another species here called Homo heidelbergensis. That's a mouthful. But what's interesting here is that the brain went a long time with nothing, then it started increasing, and then it stopped increasing and leveled off. And if you ask scientists, they don't know why. There's a bunch of theories we'll talk about. But there is no agreed upon reason for either the increase or the, the leveling off. Uh, only in Africa did fully modern humans emerge, main line of human uh, evolution. And these fully modern humans of 50,000 years ago, here we are, lived in a lifestyle called mobile hunter-gatherers in bands of 25 to 50. Mobile means they move from place to place. Hunter-gatherers means basically males hunted and females gathered, and more importantly took care of children. And they're in small bands of 25 to 50. There we are, 25 to 50. So these are small bands, and they're all over the landscape in Africa. And I don't want to confuse you, but I'm following only the main line to the fully modern humans, which is us, right? There were some others that left. Some Homo erectus left became Java man, and some of the Homo heidelbergensis, that's like a three quarter brain, left and became Neanderthals. I'm not getting into that, I'm just following the main line. And at 50,000 years, because I keep talking about 50,000 years, something very important happened, which is some of those uh, fully modern humans left Africa going up to the Northeast through Egypt and Israel, and they spread over the whole world, okay? In other words, some stayed in Africa, some spread over the whole world. That's when the human race split into the groups we know today, okay? 
50,000 years ago, which is in evolutionary time a very short time. And what that means is that human nature was fully formed, whatever human nature is, was fully formed by 50,000 years ago, because that's the last time everybody was together. Uh, all people today are fully modern. Human nature is what's common to all people. Human nature had to be in place before 50,000 years. Human nature is adapted to live as mobile hunter-gatherers in bands of 25. That's what we are adapted for. And human nature is adapted for survival. Now, I'm going to give you a quick example, which I don't like, but I'll use it. And that is, you all know we love uh, calories and sweets, right? Everybody. And calories and sweets we put on weight as fat, right? I do anyway, if nobody else. Okay, that's because it was very good back in that time in Africa. They were worried about starvation. Eat up while well, you got lots of food, store it up as fat so you don't starve to death. It was a wonderful thing at the time. Is it a wonderful thing today? Not, not as far as I'm concerned. I'll just use it myself. Okay. Anyway, now I'm finished with number one, and I'm ready to go on to topic number two. Any questions? Okay. Number topic number two: marriage in hunter-gatherer society. What was mobile? Question. Was there a question? When they left Africa and headed towards Israel, yeah. was it one? single homogenous race or was oh, it white folks and black folks? A great question. Asians or You're asking, was it, uh, oh, did they all leave at once? And the answer is no. You saw that they became full-size brains about 200,000 years ago, and we call them fully modern human at 50,000. But somewhere in that time span, people started moving out of Africa. So it was a gradual thing. We don't know when it happened. It wasn't like one mass exodus. Well, one, one theory I heard was that it was the black race migrated, and then they mutated after they migrated into other races. Well, I heard. I yeah, you're, you're half correct. Uh, basically, all the ones that stayed are what we would call Africans today. And all the ones that left, their skin lightened because of the need for sun <coughs> conversion of vitamin D. So, the, the, uh, we were all at that original time probably dark skinned. And then the move out into different climates is what caused the. I saw a question over here. Yeah. What do you refer to as human nature? Human nature. Okay. Human nature. Human nature. Human nature. Human nature. No, no, I'll define human nature. Human nature is everything that all people have in common that differentiates us from animals. So you wouldn't say a beating heart is human nature. And we usually say human nature is less than perfect. Okay. Uh, you said the brain stopped at that certain size. Yeah. But like then the time frame that you have is so short. So is yeah. there any evidence that you know it's going to grow or decrease? <laughs> you know, like uh, basically. I mean, is there any it's sign? Yeah. It's decreasing. Trust me. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I guess it's just too short a span right now to even know what they were going to involve in. Well, like, no I, brain I, I, or you know all brain. <laughs> you're getting ahead of this, but what I would say, and I think. Uh, many scientists might say, is that, first of all, it couldn't grow more because it has to get through the birth canal and there's a real problem for women with the size of the baby's head. But also that, that we developed something new in the whole world called human culture. And what's happened in the last 50,000 years is huge changes in culture without any changes in biology. We're basically the same as 50,000 years ago. They are people just like us, but we have a very different culture. Okay? That's a good question. All right. Now I'm going to do marriage and hunter-gatherer society. And what was mobile hunter-gatherer society like? And what was marriage like back then? So I'd like you to meet Jack and Jill. They happen to be Native Americans. I just went out and got some pictures. But uh, they're young uh, hunter-gatherers 
reaching the age of marriage. They're a brother and sister. Jack's looking for a wife. Jill is looking for a husband. So who can they marry? They can't marry each other, obviously, because there are uh, rules against incest. In fact, for that reason, they probably can't marry anybody in this small group because it's all their relatives. Sisters, brothers, father, mother, aunt, uncle, cousins. So, uh, let me explain the concept of exogamy in hunter-gatherer groups. In other words, Jack and Jill are in band A of 50 people, Jack and Jill. And around them, there's like a band B with 50 and a band C with 50. So if they all get together, they have a festival of 150 people, okay? In other words, no hunter-gatherer group lives in total isolation. There's always groups around, and they get together at least once a year. And exogamy is mating or marriage outside the birth group. In other words, the birth group is your 25 to 50 people you marry outside of it. So when Jack and Jill go to a festival of 150 people and they're at the point where they're starting to look for a husband or a wife, do you think they pay attention to the other 100 people? No. No. <laughs> no, I think they pay a lot of attention. Do you think Jack and Jill's parents pay attention to the possible spouses? You betcha. They probably, from the moment Jack and Jill were born, they're probably looking at these other people they know because that's the pool of possible spouses. You don't well, like Why did that happen? I mean, like, why? We don't know. I'm going to go through that, but that's, yeah, that's one of the big questions. How did we go from promiscuity yeah. to marriage? Yeah, it's big change. That's what we're talking about. <coughs> so, and what happens here is that if Jack finds, and I'm going to use the example, Jack finds a woman from band B, or they arrange the marriage, because a lot of it's family parents, then she will come back to band A and live with band A, which is a big loss to band B and a gain to band A. And if Jill finds a husband in band C, she will leave band A and go to band C. Because there uh, was a big change in evolutionary theory due to a book by Bernard Chapais in 2018, Primeval Kinship. And the subtitle is How Pair Bonding Gave Birth to Human Society. And this is addressing your question. How did we get from sexual promiscuity to pair bonding and then eventually to the form of pair bonding called marriage? I'm sorry, I'm just trying. Okay. Uh, Chapaeus, who's a person who studies primates, his thing was, I think, monkeys and the cakes. Uh, he said that in monkeys, and in monkeys, whenever they, they all, animals have exogamy just like people do. They make outside their birth group, and here's how they do it. Monkeys, when a male reaches sexual maturity, he leaves the troop and goes to a different monkey troop. Okay? And that happens in 90% of monkey species. The result of that is the females are left behind and they all know each other, right? It's a grandmother, mother, and daughter, you know, grandchildren, the granddaughters. And you wind up with a female matriarch in monkeys. And they're all tightly bonded because these are mothers who have nursed their daughters and they, you know. And meanwhile, you have the males leaving but other males coming in. But when the other males come in, they're encountering a phalanx of people who all know each other, right? So the women sort of run the show. In apes, it's the opposite. Female dispersal at sexual maturity, especially in chimpanzees, which results in males being in charge and male patriarchy, but they're not tightly bonded because males don't know who their children are and children don't know who their fathers are, right? So you've got a bunch of males, but they're all in a competitive mode called dominance, dominance hierarchies, and they're loosely bonded. So. Richard, can, can you explain the difference between a monkey and an ape? Okay, the, the monkeys are further away from us genetically. In other words, 
the the apes are the are the species the species that are closest to us, and of them, the DNA is closest in. And monkeys are tree dwellers. <coughs> They're all tree dwellers, uh, but basically, I don't know if this helps, but monkeys walk on top of the branches, apes hang beneath the branches. They feed by holding on and grabbing fruit. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, so now we're getting back to Jack and Jill. You know, we assume that Jack would take a wife from band B and bring her back, and Jill would go to band C. And that's because whenever the transition took place to pair bonding, it would have been with a chimpanzee model, which is female dispersal, because that's what chimpanzees do. Chimpanzees disperse, and in fact, the males can't go to another chimpanzee tribe, because the chimpanzee males, they're together, are all very territorial, and they will beat up or kill the intruder. Now you say, how can females do it? Well, they go when they're in estrus. They change troops when they're in estrus, and then every male has only one thing on its mind. <laughs> the important point to notice about this exogamy, it says down there, mating or marriage outside birth, is that not only is it how Jack and Jill find spouses, right, but the effect it has because those chimpanzee groups that fight each other, they fight, they defend their borders, they kill, they're actually, Jane Goodall uh, had an example where one group of chimpanzees systematically went out and killed all the males in the nearby group and took their women. But that's chimpanzees fighting each other. But because of this intermarriage, the human groups are close to the nearby bands, the ones they have a festival with. And it's this intermarriage that caused that, however it came about. Uh, so then there's monogamy, and monogamy is one man, one wife, you all know that. Polygamy has two kinds. Polygyny, a man allowed multiple wives, and polyandry, a woman allowed multiple husbands, okay? And in these groups, about 29% have monogamy, about 71% will allow a man to have more than one. And polyandry is almost non-existent. And, and that's important because everybody talks about, well, polygamous. Well, it's not really polygamous, it's polygynous. Basically, societies are either polygynous, meaning a male with, is allowed more than one wife, or monogamous. <clears throat> The polyandrous is just so small, it doesn't matter. Uh, now, the, there is a paradox, which is that polygyny is more common than monogamy, right? However, most hunter-gatherer societies are effectively monogamous. Now, what do I mean by that? Very few hunter-gatherer males can afford to provide food for more than one female. So even if it's allowed, it doesn't happen very often, and most of the society is monogamous. And even if you look at the male who has more than one wife, you know, that's polygynous, to the woman, she only has one husband. She can't have more than one husband. So she, the woman, is effectively monogamous, even if the man can be polygynous. And the importance of that is that every child, or almost every child, have a socially identified father. In other words, you'll hear a lot about, well, we're not, you know, hunter-gatherers are not monogamous. They're not. But they are effectively monogamous in the sense that the children all have a father. Because a man with more than one wife, there are separate households. If, if the husband can have more than one wife, but the wife can't have more than one husband, yeah. then what you, then you must have an awful lot of men without any wives. You, yeah, which is one of the reasons why there's very few men that have more than one wife in hunter-gatherer society. When you get up to agricultural society where people can get rich, then 
then it's a different thing. But this is hunter-gatherer, pure hunter-gatherers before agriculture. Unless the population of the women is three times the, the population no, no. of the men. <laughs> yeah. Every time, in other words, if the number of men and women is approximately equal, it means that for every man with more than one wife, there's, there's a man who is celibate. Yeah, right, but, you know, there is a pressure in societies to uh, have monogamy simply because then you don't have a bunch of disaffected males running around. One question, okay, so when you talk about hunter-gatherers, are you basing this information on current hunter-gatherers? No. And if you were doing it from, uh, no. from you know, ancient years ago, mm -hmm. uh, how do they know? How, yeah. how, are they, how, how is this theory, how are they figuring out whether or not they're literally married uh, and, and, you know? Yeah, yeah, the question is, what's this based on? And the fact is, you've had anthropologists starting in the 19th century, the late 1800s, who go out to, like, the South Sea Islands and live there and write up reports. So we have reports of more than 500, uh, more than 100, 150, different hunter-gatherer societies. So, uh, does that? Yes. Yeah. And, and the same thing with monkeys. You know, there's people that go out and live with monkeys. James would all went out and lived with chimpanzees. You know, they're all writing reports. So when you want to go back and look at it, that's what you look at. Okay. Topic number three, morality and cooperation. <clears throat> and morality is about cooperation, suppressing selfish interests for the sake of the group. Chimpanzees are notoriously self-centered. Hunter-gatherer groups are strongly egalitarian and group-centered. And how did chimpanzee descendants become egalitarian and more group-centered? The answer is morality. So coming down to the trees, when the chimpanzees came down to the trees, they faced a dangerous situation with predators. Like all prey animals, they were forced to form groups. That's what prey animals do. They had to organize and cooperate to defend themselves. And the loosely bonded patriarchy had to change to survive. Because if you're all individualists and a lion attacks, that's not going to work out very well. Science doesn't know exactly how they changed to be more group oriented, but they did survive. And eventually, humans became the hunters. The big hunters. Okay. Um, dominance hierarchies versus egalitarianism. Chimpanzees live in dominance hierarchies. There's an alpha male, number two, number three. You know, whenever two chimpanzee males meet, it's like <coughs> one goes like that and the other, you know, like grovels. And females also have a dominance hierarchy. Hunter gatherers live an egalitarian lifestyle, placing much emphasis on sharing meat from large animals that are killed. So how did this change take place from the chimpanzee dominance hierarchies to all these, to, to this egalitarianism? And the scientist who studied this most thoroughly is an anthropologist named Christopher Bohm. This is Christopher Bohm. He wrote a book called Hierarchy in the Forest, 1999. And you see the subtitle, The Evolution of Egalitarian Behavior. This changed because what he was, he studied hunter-gatherer tribes, and then he decided he wanted to go uh, see chimpanzees, and he joined Jane Goodall for a few years. And, and he was so surprised that the egalitarians he had seen and the chimpanzees with their dominance are, you know, how did this happen? And what he began to realize was that the egalitarian societies, hunter-gatherers, had to spend a lot of time and energy enforcing egalitarianism. Because men, it's always men, want to become bullies and start being bossy, and they had to keep those dominant alpha types under control. And the way they did that was by being eternally vigilant. And he, he concluded that hunter-gatherers have a reverse dominance hierarchy. Here's a dominance hierarchy on the left of chimpanzees, the alpha at the top, okay? In effect, what Bohm said 
was that hunter-gatherers have a reverse dominance hierarchy where the, the vast uh, group of them keep the alpha at the bottom under control. And whenever a man started acting like a bully, they were brought under control by gossip. Did you see how, you know, and if that didn't work, he actually has evidence from these reports of, you know, they actually kill the bully. They're not going to allow somebody to become dominant. And so that was a, a huge change. And what are the causes of egalitarianism? Well, his conclusion, and this is from looking at 51 hunter-gatherer societies that had as little contact with agriculture, you know, and they all had egalitarianism. And uh, his conclusion was that it happened when weapons made combat too dangerous. And also, lower-ranking males didn't like groveling so they were happy to enforce this and not allow somebody else. Possible influence of language and coalitions, that much later. But if the change had to do with weapons, that might place it at two and a half million years ago when tools first appeared, which was also when that brain started. Anyway, that's his theory. Uh, Evolutionary morality, now I'm changing <clears throat> subjects. And if morality arose from evolution, then moral categories can be related to the situations where they came from. And early humans lived for many years in mobile hunter-gatherer bands. And if so, then the moral instincts or moral impulses of modern people can be probed to see whether they relate to the hunter-gatherer background. And what is evolutionary morality? And the person who's done the most work on this is a man named Jonathan Haidt. He wrote a book called The Righteous Mind, 2012, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And he did most of his work at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, right down in Philadelphia, where he was doing surveys on student population, and then he went out to the local McDonald's in Western Philadelphia and did it on, on working class people. And then he did the same things in two different areas of Brazil. You know, one was a Europeanized area and one was more of a native area, but the higher class population and the working class. So by the time he did that, well, he, what, what he does was he asks these really fascinating questions. But if a man, buys a chicken and then has sex with the chicken and cooks it and eats it. Has he done anything wrong? Or a woman finds a beat up flag and doesn't want it to go to waste, so she tears it into piece and uses it to clean her toilet. Has she done anything wrong? You, you can see what he's doing, though. He's trying, and then he asks people not just to say, well, yes or no, but to say, well, what are they thinking? And and the results were really quite interesting. Uh, you, uh, these questionnaires are online. You can go to yourmorals.org and take this. You know, millions of people have taken this quiz, and he's got all sorts of statistics that are calculated. And part of this is a theory called the triune brain. I don't know if many of you have heard of this, but. The reptilian brain is the brain stem, that's the breathing and the digestion. Here is the emotional brain, the amygdala, and then here up on top is the prefrontal neocortex, the rational brain. And of course, we tend to think that we do everything rationally, right? Well, that's what is now in question. I mean, you've all been in arguments about moral issues, right, at some time. And does the rational argument always win? Ha, ha, ha. Okay. So Jonathan Haidt refers to this as the elephant and the writer. In other words, the elephant is the emotional brain, and the writer is the rational brain. And he says, it's the elephant that makes most of our decisions, our emotions make our decisions, and then the rational brain helps out a little bit. In fact, he calls the rational brain the press agent. 
And the press agent may not know why the elements doing something, but they'll come up with a good reason, <laughs> right? So much of our life is spent rationalizing things that we, conclusions we come to for emotional reasons. And it's why whenever you get into arguments, you know, there's never a winner or somebody changing your mind. So, now, here are the six moral foundations he found from his study. And on the left, we have care versus harm. And to him, the evolutionary basis is the care of children and not harming people within the group. That's a very important part of morality. Uh, fairness versus cheating, because hunter-gatherers always share all meat very equally. He, they, the hunter doesn't get more, they share because they have to be bonded together and not let somebody starve. And liberty versus oppression, which is about the problem of bullies and not allowing the bully to oppress the group. <coughs> then there's loyalty betrayal, which is loyalty to the group. You know, if you're in a group, you better be loyal or uh, authority subversion, which is usually about the sources of authority. Often it's parental authority or group authority. And sanctity degradation, you could also think of that as religion, but a lot of it's about food choices that you should avoid because they might make you sick. So anyway, these are all in his mind. He came up with these based on his surveys and then he tried to, you know, um, a portion of according to hunter-gatherer morality. Now what he found was there was a big difference between all of the uh, testing he did outside of American Europe and American Europe. And in fact he found that Western morality was very focused on this one and these two, whereas across the world they were focused on all six of them. <laughs> but it was a very sharp breakdown, and often even in America, between the upper educated, upper class educated, and the working class. You know, they tend to pay more attention to loyalty, which is like patriotism, authority, which is like police or parents, and sanctity, which you could talk about religion. So his view was that people in America, he's a liberal Democrat, but he thinks that liberal Democrats spend too much time on these and they ignore those. And he happened to work on the Al Gore campaign in 2000 and the John Kerry one in 2004, which both lost. And he thought that part of it was the Democrats were not paying enough attention to those issues which are part of us cross-culturally and allowing the Republicans to make points on that more than they needed to. Anyway, that was his mm. advice to me. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and so there's this Western morality, it wasn't Jonathan, but the term weird, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, that was different from the overseas populations, or the third world, or however you want to say it. Okay, because cross-culturally, people take all six into account, whereas Western morality tends to focus on the left side, the uh, care of harm, especially. This is his, uh, so here are the six foundations, and uh, yeah, and, and the, big, the big difference between these is Western morality is very individualistic individual center, whereas authority elsewhere is often very group-centered. You know, how will this change affect society? Most Americans don't take that into account, or as much as people overseas do. So it's an individualistic morality versus a, he calls it socio-centric, a society-centered morality. This is what he said. And what's interesting about his book is that this is a book you can give to anybody you want to about politics and religion, and they'll probably love it. You'll just learn a lot. You know, he's not trying to make a case. He's trying to help people understand each other. Okay, 
Uh, now we're on to topic number three. Questions about topic number three, but I don't want to get hung up in politics. Yeah. He's not talking to hunter-gatherers anymore. He, yeah, oh yeah, his surveys are all modern. He's relating to the moral impulses of modern people. He, his starting point was finding out that the morality itself was moral rather than rational. And once you do that, then he's trying to probe to understand where it came from and link it back to its source. Because presumably, all human nature, all the stuff we have in common, came out of that hunter-gatherer era. And that's what he's doing. All I'm doing here is an overview to try to show you that morality and cooperation were a big change. You know, the egalitarianism of hunter-gatherers, which by the way, when you get to agriculture, the egalitarianism won't collapse, right? You've got chiefs and emperors and kings and everybody fighting, right? And, and so the task today is often how do you get control of the bullies, the dominant alphas, you know, in a modern society, and that was done by like Greek democracy, the English Magna Carta, the American constitutions about how to control, you know, a leader, and uh, and of course that we see societies looking back like Erdogan in Turkey or Putin in Russia, you know, that idea of controlling bullies, dominant alphas was a battle was won in hunter-gatherer society and then lost with agriculture and now we're trying to win it again. I'm getting theoretical here, but... Okay, evolution of symbolic language. Uh, well, let me... Let me know. Okay. Symbolic language is very difficult because we think in words and concepts, right? But where did words and concepts come from? Does a chimpanzee think? What is consciousness? <coughs> and the main theorist here is named Rowan Donald, three stages of consciousness. And this was way back in 1991, that's what, 27 years ago. He's called the mimetic, mythic, and theoretic. And by mimetic, he meant like mind imitation, gesture language, it's non vocal. Mythic, storytelling, proto language, it's vocal, it's a very simple proto language. And then eventually, theoretic, you have writing and full symbolic language. That was his framework. Now, as you know, people were trying to find a framework they liked, what they found out was that chimpanzees cannot control their vocalizations. You know, they vocalize in response to something like a nature, but they don't initiate vocal, but they can control their gestures. So that made it a lot more likely that this model was correct. Okay? That gesture language came first and then vocalizations came. Now, uh, an example, let me put this very uh, you have a dog and you get out the leash, right? That's a gesture. The dog does what starts prancing around because he knows what that gesture means, right? So then you say, uh, "Well, should we take out? Should we take the dog out? You know, because we're not we're trying to avoid the dog." And the dog says, "My dog learned the word out. <laughs> you heard the word out in the sentence. Starts prancing around. So then we say, "Will you take the dog? Oh, you teeth. Pretty soon the dog learned all oh, you teeth. <laughs> I'm not kidding." So, uh, you know, that's, that's the fact that, that uh, you know, then another story. When I, uh, well, back in 1988, uh, my wife at that time, my first wife and I, decided to have a foster child in our home. You know, this is New Jersey diapers. And they came in and they said, would you accept two uh, Vietnamese uh, teenagers, 16 and 14, but they don't know any English. Okay, yeah. So anyway, the translator comes in, drops them off, and then we're there with people who really don't know any English. And so the next two months or more was like, I, I, nose, nose, you know, going through the whole house, chair, chairs, you know. I, I mean, that was desperation. That wasn't a planned uh, way of attending, you know, but 
But that sort of led me uh, to think, that, and they were ready for mainstreaming in the local school, which was Point Pleasant Beach, by uh, the end of the summer. So anyway, they learned. I don't know how much was from that, but the fact is that, that <clears throat> a lot of what we do with language has to do with pointing more than most people realize. I, this is my way of looking at it. I, I think of Stan Point Grunt. Stan is a chimpanzee standing on two legs which breathes their hands, pointing and is a gesture, and then combining a grunt with a point, you know, pointing and grunting. And if you have a distinguishable grunt, that's the equivalent of a word. So I would add here gesture language pointing, Storytelling distinguishable grunts with a single referent because the dog learns it because there's only one thing that the leash means or the word out means, and then full symbolic. We get into hierarchic abstractions. For example, I can teach my dog to go to my sister Ruth or my sister Mary, right? But if I say to the dog, go to sister. I want to teach the dog to know that sister is a category that includes just those two people. The dog doesn't get it. Or to go to my brother Dan or my brother Paul. And they are all single referent words. You can teach a small brain creature single referent words, but sister and brother are abstractions, and sibling is a second level abstraction. Anyway. So, oh, topic number five. So anyway, language, where did language come from? Well, presumably it came from the chimpanzees starting with gesture language, eventually hooking it up with some kind of, you know, mama, papa are the favorite words that might have been the first ones. And then eventually building up syntax and the hierarchic expressions. We carry around, I think, 50,000 words, typical person, where we know the definitions. You know, if you show me a picture of a unicorn, I can say that's a unicorn or it's not, even though I've never seen a unicorn. We just have this huge library, which is why we have a big brain. So when apes evolved into human beings, yeah. the first human beings, what was the level of symbolic language? We have no idea. Oh. Uh, well, I can tell you uh, what the what the general scientific conclusion is. Remember the brain getting larger? That it had to be very late because it takes a large brain to handle symbolic language. Okay. What, what I would say, like, what I would say is that that's true for the the abstractions, but it's not true for the single referent words. You could have a homo habilis, you know, understanding single reference words, I would say. So we'll see that. Okay, topic five, expensive tool use. And I'm not going to say much about this, except that some early tools are unknown, like the use of clubs, because they don't fossilize. So we sort of think that they must have been using something to fight off lines and use. There were all the one tools at 2.55, you saw that in the chart. And they changed to a new kind called a chewing about 1.76. The most important here is fire. And this is a huge argument in anthropology when fire showed up. Because some people, you can only prove it like in the last 200,000 years. But some people think as much as 2 million years ago, you can see fire. And the problem is, you know, fire can come from natural sources. Or... Okay, uh, putting it all together. And here is our main timeline. And we had a small brain all the way halfway through. Then here are tools and butchering and homo habilis, homo erectus, going to fully modern humans. And then it stopped. What caused the brain to start growing there? What caused it to stop? up here. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, this is, here are the main hypotheses. The one that it has the most support now, none of these are, have captured the field, but 
is the social brain hypothesis, a guy named Robin Dunbar, intelligence developed to solve the problem of a large number of social relationships in group, including deception and coalition building. Mammal brains seem to be related to the size of the social group. So he's looking at all brains, the larger the social group you're in, the bigger a brain you need to keep track of who's dominant to whom and what's your relationship and who's ticked off and who else or whatever. Climate change hypothesis, that two and a half million year period was the start of the Pleistocene area that included the four ice ages in the northern hemisphere. So here, that's the two and a half year period and that is also the start of the Pleistocene. In other words, climate change with the back and forth of climate may have had an effect. And the third one is hunting and warfare. That was the time tools showed up. So very popular hypothesis back in the 1960s was about aggression and, and hunting being the driving force for evolution. That really has not panned out very well, but it could be part of it. Thank you. Yeah. OK. <laughs> now we still have some time left. And, OK, Fred. I would like to emphasize the fact that humans do not evolve from apes. Six million years ago, our ancestors broke up from the ancestors of apes. That's correct. You know, I say chimpanzees came to the ancestors of chimpanzees. The only thing we can compare it to is chimpanzees, and we think that's fairly good because they're still living in the same habitat. They're still living in the trees. But you're right. It was not chimpanzees that we have now, which have evolved five million years from the ones back then. So I would agree with that. Uh, I do have a reading list I'm going to pass out to you. If you're interested in any of these, it gives you the names of the books and titles and stuff that you can go to. I saw somebody in the back, and then I'll take Kim and you first. I'll take you. So I'm um, curious. Uh, it, has there been any thought about whether it was the growing bigger brains no. that enabled uh, tool making and tool use in symbolic language, or if it was the other way around, that the drive towards tool making and symbolic language caused the brain to grow bigger? The quick answer is we don't know. Okay. You know, that, that, that what, what has priority is a big question, and I'm going to say one thing here, and that is that my view is that because small brain creatures can do proto-language, I think that's what started. Because everybody says, why did it start increasing there? I ask, why couldn't it increase in a society for two and a half minutes? It couldn't increase, in my view, because they didn't have communication. Even an Einstein back there wasn't going to have smarter kids because <coughs> there's no ability to communicate <coughs> what he knows. So I think. Communication must have started there, but that's my theory. I, uh, please don't be offended, but <clears throat> um, the use of the word uh, promiscuity. Yeah. Okay, when we're talking about the chimps and the apes, um, it's not really promiscuous, it's a survival uh, impulse. Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the current theory is that the reason the female mates with all the males is because she doesn't want any of them that's right. to right. feel right. like that's not their kid. Right. And then they might kill the right. kid. So. But one thing that I have tried to do throughout is I haven't talked a lot about theory. Because the moment you get into theory, people have all these theories. And you know, I just want to keep it very factual, the five big changes that have taken place, sort of where the state of research is, and what you should go to. That's the list. Yeah. Your background. Yeah. Your, your. Uh, what is your background? <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know from my friend Peter, uh, I went to Exeter uh, Academy in New Hampshire, Phillips, a private club school, and uh, then I spent 25 years as a corporate manager for financial insurance. I was manager of nationwide PR projects for them. And then I made a sudden change into ordained ministry, and I was a minister for 26 years, and now I'm retired. So this is a hobby of yours. It's this, I've always been fascinated by it, and about four years ago, I really got into this. And 
And it just happened to be when a lot of this stuff was coming to light. So it's been fascinating for me. I see what you have. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, Richard, thank you for this, and it was very well planned out, and I, I actually would like to know if you were to, to do Evolution Part 2 or 3 or whatever, what would it be about, because I think you have a good audience here for this. Well, let's talk about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the thing that I'm working on right now is another one called The Bible for Atheists or Non-Believers. Okay. That's a whole okay. thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that interesting? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Hey, I'd love to do that one. Thank you. Okay. Very much.